welcome to Branches. My name is Alexis and I'm an amateur genealogist. And in my channel, I cover everything genealogy. And today I am going to be talking about John Binion, who was um, a very prominent man in the Mormon church. It's basically about his life and what he did and everything like that. So let's get started. So. This is a um, shortened version of the history of him. I found this excerpt from um, the Binion Family Book, Volume 1. I'm not sure how many volumes there are. Let me see. There are four volumes to this book, or to this set. And, but this is just a small little bit about him, and here we go. On Moor Lane, about one mile north of the village of Howarden in Wales, Samuel and John Binion, founders of the Binion family in Utah, were born. Their father, John Binion Sr., was the Lisi or Lessi of a small farm and home that is known to this day as the John Binion Farm. In the quiet stillness of this rural district was born Samuel on the 11th of December in 1818 and on July 9th, 1820, his younger brother John was born at the same place. Now that, um, that John, the John Jr., is the one who we'll be talking about today. The early life of these two boys, we have but slight knowledge. We know that the educational facilities were very meager in the community and little opportunity was given to either to attend even the poor schools of that time. Yet we know that both became excellent penmen. Both had a fair knowledge of mathematics and appreciation of good literature. And above all, as they toiled and struggled through life, they appreciated and took on to themselves all that was good in the practical education of everyday life. They became known everywhere as men of sterling worth worth and reliability men whose word was equal to any bond so they were as good as their word they were respectable gentlemen there is no written account of the early life of john binion but from his own lips we learned that about the age of 16 having been accused of trespassing upon the game preserves of some wealthy nobleman by setting snares for hares or other small animals and being threatened with prosecution for poaching. He left home very suddenly for Liverpool. No more to return for nearly 40 years. He was gone for 40 years from his home. He tells us that his father was able and willing to pay the fine that might be imposed upon him, but he felt that he would leave for home forever rather than be subjected to the injustice and indignity of prosecution for trapping wild animals for food i mean i get that why why should he be in trouble for feeding himself and his family it's ridiculous arriving at liverpool he apprenticed as an iron molder and boiler maker and as such he helped make the first marine boiler ever made the ensuing years from 1836 to 1842 he was so engaged but during this time he had become converted to the Mormon faith under the teaching of the late President John Taylor. And on 23rd of February, 1842, eight days after his marriage to Esther Wainwright, set sail for Nauvoo, Illinois. His faith in the gospel, deep-rooted and strong, found satisfaction in the country, the people, the promises that had been held out to him, and above all, in his firm conviction of the of the divinity of the mission and purposes of the prophet Joseph Smith, whom he had met and come to know. He became an earnest advocate by correspondence with his father, his brother Samuel, and other relatives of the good things to be found in America. He told them of the advantages of being aboard the good ship Zion, meaning being in close touch with the body of the church. What success he had is shown by the arrival of Samuel and their father, John Sr., who was now a widower, who had sailed from Liverpool to join John in Nauvoo. Following the reunion of the two brothers and their father at 
father at Nauvoo in 1845, we find each of the brothers living in comfortable brick houses, their father with them. The brothers not only cared for their farms, but found time to work for others, and in so doing, established a reputation for industry, good judgment, and square dealing that remained with them throughout their lives. In May 1846, due to the persecution and mob violence, they were forced to dis dispose of their homes for a mere nothing and journeyed westward to the wilderness of Iowa. Together they had taken part in the defense Nauvoo, of Nauvoo, and now they fitted up their ox teams and wagons for a journey they knew not where. That's that had to be frightening. Their entire earthly belongings were loaded into the heavy wagons, ox teams, and being driven by the women as well as the men. They traveled 150 miles west, located at Garden Grove, Iowa, now known as Decatur. Here they raised cabins, brought new land under cultivation, planted a crop of corn and buckwheat. It was here that death from an attack of bilious fever and dumb, dumb age, Egg? I'm not sure what, what that means, claimed the life of their beloved father on the September 24th, 1846. He was laid to rest at the foot of a big oak tree in the field where he had labored. Early in 1847, they loaded up and journeyed westward to the Missouri River, where they joined the main body of saints going to the Rocky Mountains. The Binion brothers were not included in the original Pioneer Company, but instead, made a trip to Missouri for provisions. Upon their return, they began the march to the westward wilderness, being attached to Joseph's Holmes 50 and Edwards Hunter's 100. Much thought and care had been given in the preparation for this journey. The two wagons contained clothing, provisions, implements, seed, grain, garden seeds, and everything else that thought and ingenuity could suggest that their limited means could procure. This wisdom was abundantly demonstrated during the next two years. Besides the oxen actually drawing the wagons, Samuel had two or three cows, John had a gray mare, two cows yoked, two heifers, and seven sheep. Any record of the Binion brothers' journey from the banks of the Missouri River to their Rocky Mountain home has been destroyed. That's a shame. The arrival into the valley was early enough to build for themselves a comfortable two-story house, Samuel occupying the lower story and John on the top story. This house was built on the southwest corner of the block situated diagonally across the street from the northeast corner of what is known as Pioneer Square. Here they resided for a year. When spring came, they moved out on the five-acre survey locating on Harley's Canyon Creek, west of 5th, 5th East Street, where they spent the summer farming and fighting crickets for the crops. President Brigham Young wanted the lands occupied by the Binion brothers and, at his request, moved to a point across Jordan River north of 14th South. On January 9, 1849, they crossed the Jordan on ice and began the settlement of Over Jordan. The following summer, they moved upriver to Field Bottom, north of the present site of Taylorsville. John Binion located at Field Spring, where they built a house out of whipsawed logs that had already served them twice for the same purpose, in Salt Lake City and at 14th South. Here, fields were laid out, levees thrown up, fences made, and the water from Bingham Creek channeled to their farms. They lived here until the fall of 1850, when they moved further south to another bend in the river, where they built permanent homes. They again used the whipsawed logs of 1847 in the new home. During the years 49 and 50, the Indians had committed depredations on the settlers, necessitating the sending of armed force against them, and the Binney brothers took part in the fight known as the Tenpenny Ute War on the Provo River. This and other hostilities led to the building of forts. Among them was the English Fort, about one mile north of the present site of Taylorsville. The ground is now the Taylorsville Cemetery. The Binions bought, brought with them from their eastern home several cows and sheep from which had grown herds of cows and sheep. 
but to the farming step by step and inch by inch, the stubborn salt grass yielded to a persistent force and strength of ox and plow. And when harvest time came, they gathered in the precious growth of the summer season, boys and girls from six to 12 were assigned tasks demanding courage and responsibility in the care of handling of livestock. John Binion records that he spent the winter of 54 through 55 in caring for sheep and cattle on his homestead, hauling material to the fort, plowing, etc. But at the same time, not forgetting to attend meetings, Sunday schools, dances, supervised day schools, visit with old friends, practice sword drills with the militia, and he also gave bond as assessor and collector for forfeiting purposes. The sheep and cattle belonging to the two brothers were driven to the north end of Rush Valley in the fall of 1855. The expedition in charge of John Binion, who took his entire family with him. The late winter and early spring saw the return of the family to Taylorsville and a long and tedious effort it was to get back to the old home with the weak and dying cattle and sheep. The loss in livestock was quite heavy. There was a constant interchange of labor, hunting of lost horses and cattle, washing and shearing of sheep, etc. Especially is this true as between Binion brothers and Joseph Harker and their children. There came a period of growth and material advancement in which the Binion family shared their livestock increased rapidly, field and garden yielded more and better products with less labor. More money was in circulation, homes better furnished, merchandise could be bought at prices far below what had been hence to foreknown, and people felt themselves prosperous and happy. On the 20th of July in 1856, John took a second wife. He married Esther Ann Birch in Salt Lake City. She was the daughter of William and Mary Rogers Birch on April 19th, 1857, John took a third wife. He married Mary Ann Turpin in Salt Lake City. She was the daughter of William and Elizabeth Tidswell Turpin. The winter of 1862 through 1863 demonstrated that Jordan Range was no longer a suitable place for the increased number of livestock now being raised there. And on July 8, 1863, a party of 12 men, among them John and Samuel Binion, started out exploring in search of new pastures. This resulted in the section at the south end of Rush Valley for ranching purposes for the entire party. The Binion brothers were not slow to avail themselves of the grazing facilities afforded by the Rush Valley country. On the 14th of August, they started both cattle and sheep for the new herd ground. Upon arrival there, a permanent camp was located on a small creek later known as Binion Creek, and the canyon out of which it flowed was known as Binion Canyon. This camp was designated in John Binion's writings as Mountain Home, but later was known as the Old Place. Here, each of the Binion brothers built a cabin, corrals, a garden patch, and maintained for the next 12 years headquarters for both sheep and cattle interests, which grew and prospered abundantly during that time. The home thus established, while always humble and unpretentious, was yet the scene of much quiet enjoyment and contentment to the various members of the family. On the 25th of October, 1863, John, who had been acting as president elder of the Taylorsville branch of the West Jordan Board, was released, and Samuel appointed to take his place, the former expecting to give much time and attention to the livestock interests in Rush Valley. He wrote and recorded in his journal on New Year's 1864, the year 1863 has now gone, a year with big events that were to take place in later days. Wars and rumors of wars are becoming so common among the nations of the world that they attract but little notice among the Latter-day Saints, situated here in these peaceful vales of desert. And yet these things are pointing to the drawing near of the time of the coming of Jesus to put down the wicked rule and avenge the blood of the prophets. A son has been added to the family, and we have named him William. The Lord hath prospered, uh, prospered us in our labors. We have finished and moved into our new house. May we so adorn and beautifully beautify it that our children and grandchildren, when they are scattered about on the waves of time and chance, may with pleasure remember the happy home on Jordan River. 
In October of 1864, John Binion was called to go into Utah's Dixie and engage in the raising of cotton. But in lieu of going himself, he outfitted and sent a substitute, William Jones. After a year or two of expensive experimentation, this was found to be unsuccessful and was abandoned. In the fall of 1868, after almost four years of assiduous labor on the Jordan home, John received a missionary call to Dixie again, where he was to labor under the direction of Elder Erastus Snow in strengthening of the muddy settlements located in Lincoln County, Nevada. To hear was to obey, and on November 11th, with his wife Esther and her family, he started on this mission, a mission that occupied five of the best years of his life, and that required him to establish not less than a half dozen different homes, as he was called from place to place by the church authorities. And as in their judgment, he could best serve them, acting as caretaker of sheep and cattle for the people, or as bishop of the ward. At the end of five years, he was released and returned with his family to the Jordan home, to which, in the course of his mission, he had made several trips, during one of which he had, under suggestion from President Young, visited his old home in England for the purpose of gathering up genealogical data and of once more getting in touch with the members of his family. The trip he enjoyed very much, being well and cordially received by his relatives there. The data has been carefully compiled and is carried to the family genealogical record. Following the return from the Dixie mission, he devoted himself to the care of the Jordan home, but especially to the watch care and education of his large family, consisting chiefly of boys ranging in years from infancy to 15. Feeling that he himself had passed the zenith of his life and that his circumstances were sufficiently prosperous and affluent that he could afford to look upon life rather from the social and intellectual side than from the financial and material point of view, as had been largely his wont heretofore. And thus his life, hitherto one of strenuous toil and activity, rounded out by a period of three or four years following the return from Dixie in 1873, of peace and happiness surrounded by a large family that loved and honored him. During this time, his energies were devoted to the further improvement of his homes, planting of trees, the teaching of his young boys how to work, encouraging and directing them in educational matters, and generally by precept and example, living a life of plain, honest, God-fearing man whose whole aim and ambition was not personal gratification in, but rather the uplift of mankind in general and especially that his family should grow up in the nurture and a admonition of the Lord, capable, intelligent, and useful men and women, worthy of the high ideals which he had conceived as the natural logical product of the religious faith, which he had espoused, and for which he had always fought so valiantly. While thus engaged, and on the morning of August 31st, 1877, he mounted a gentle old horse to ride over to Brother Sam's to arrange for a threshing machine when working there to come over to his place and likewise thresh his crops. Well, on the way, he stopped at the Webster blacksmith shop to attend a small matter of business and having accomplishment, accomplished it, mounted his horse by stepping first upon the tongue of a spring wagon that stood conveni conveniently near. The action resulted in an internal injury of some kind from which he suffered extreme agony for nearly 24 hours and from the effects of which he died the following day. His funeral was held under the shade of the trees he had planted and loved so well, and of him it was well and truthfully said. One of nature's noblemen has passed away from earth. John is buried in the Salt Lake City Cemetery. The foregoing account of the lives and labors of Samuel and John Binion is taken from the letters and journals of the younger brother, but since same was written, a study of the other records has been made, and in accordance therewith, the following story of the life of Samuel Binion, the Elder Brothers, has been written. So that is a shortened version of the life of John Binion, one of the more prominent men in Mormonism, who got started one of the pioneers, I should say. 
and it's pretty interesting because my family was brought over here by his family now i don't know if it was he himself john or his brother samuel who brought um my family over but he did work for the family my my family member and if you want there's another video of him out um if you want to go check that out you can do that so it's a little bit of his life story and how he came over here and how the Binion brothers helped him get started in life here in the United States in Utah. And that's it for today. So go ahead and give this video a like, a little thumbs up there. Leave a comment if you have any questions or anything if you'd like to add to this video. And go ahead and subscribe. Don't forget to hit that notification bell so that you can be notified when videos go live. I'll see you guys later.